disrupt, and it's showtime from downtown. What a bang. Boxes pass, a shot, they score! Shankly Cutter scores! What a stop by Hellebach. Nikolai Ehlers off the face off. Ground Control, the official podcast of the Winnipeg Jets, hosted by Jets TV. Well, hello once again, and welcome back to Ground Control, the official podcast of the Winnipeg Jets. As I sit here at uh, our Carlton Street offices, it's snowing once again. Uh, so I hope uh, you're either listening to this after you've shoveled, or maybe you're doing it while you're shoveling, snow blowing, what have you. Lots of snow here in the city uh, of Winnipeg. Joined, as always, on the podcast by Mitchell Clinton, who uh, I think just came in from shoveling, uh, judging by how he looks over Zoom. And uh, Paul Edmonds as well from 680 CJOB joining us now. Uh, guys, before we get into things, I'll give a quick rundown. Obviously, the week in review, as we always do. Uh, then we'll talk to Paul about uh, just the physical nature of how the Winnipeg Jets have won hockey games as of late and just why that needs to be a calling card for this group. Uh, Mark Shifley, he's got goals in four straight. We'll talk a little bit about that. The power play, while it didn't strike against Chicago on Monday, has been clicking as of late. Dennis Bayak, uh, everybody's favorite uh, television play-by-play man, will join us as the guest. And then we'll look ahead to the week upcoming for the Winnipeg Jets. And then Christian Reichel, he's, uh, he's definitely made an impact as he's returned to the lineup, playing on a line with Andrew Kopp and Adam Lowry. So a great show teed up for you guys today. Mitchell, we'll start with you. Uh, just a quick look back at the week that was the Dallas Stars nipping the Winnipeg Jets on Friday night, 4-3 in overtime, but uh, the Jets tying it late to get that extra point. And then uh, a heck of a game down in Tennessee as the Jets beat the Preds 5-2, uh, a come-from-behind win at that. And then uh, a tough result on Monday night here at Canada Life Centre. The final game of 50% capacity going to the full clip uh, starting on Wednesday, the Jets falling 3-1 to the Chicago Blackhawks. Mitch, just your thoughts on the week that the Winnipeg Jets put together. Uh, I mean, you're, you're building off of the win over the Minnesota wild. That was the big thing. And it was the question over the, the couple of days afterwards leading into that short little two game road trip is how do you bring that consistency? Cause it's something that Dave Lowry and the players have touched on a lot over the, the, the last week or so, and really the entire season, as well as they try to, you know, mount a, a charge to get into the, uh, into that wild card, uh, spot in the Western conference. And then, you know, you go into Dallas and it's a, it's a team that you're trying to chase down. So you're doing absolutely everything you can to try to, you know, to, to gain some ground on them. And uh, ultimately you need uh, Mark Shifley to come up big with a, with a one-timer that beats Jake Ottinger in the final minute uh, to get the game to overtime. So that's good. And then Mark Shifley almost wins it about 10 seconds into the overtime period. So that would have been a massive second point, but ultimately it's Dallas. that's going to take that one. Um, I remember I was watching the, the last few minutes kind of tick down. I was down by the dressing room, just getting ready for, uh, for media. So we could be ready to go to, to stream and all that fun stuff. And, uh, the roar that came out of the, the coach's office, you know, where our, our video coaches, uh, hang out and, uh, communication staff and the trainers as they wait for the players, uh, the roar that came out of there was massive, uh, when Mark Shifley scored to tie the game. So that was kind of. You know they're passionate, but sometimes it's just kind of really cool to hear it. Uh, and then obviously overtime doesn't go their way. So then you have to refocus for a, a big one against the Nashville Predators. You need to come home from that road trip with points and and a few of them. Uh, they go down two to nothing, but they just – special teams was really the big one that, that game. Um, you know, Nashville known for being penalized up and among the most in the National Hockey League. It was another physical battle, which seems to suit the Winnipeg Jets really well. Uh, Jets get a goal at four on four from Mark Shifley again uh, on a one timer. And then uh, really, they just kind of rolled the scoring five unanswered. Blake Wheeler with five points. That was a big night for him. And I thought the coolest part in terms of the power play goal that Wheeler scored uh, the first of two on that five minute major in the third period. Um, he said it was something that he and Mark Shifley and a couple of the other guys on the power play talked about might be an option just from the power plays that they had already done in the game, the video that they had played uh, prior to the game, they thought maybe that backdoor tap in would be there if they could get that look and they got it, they executed it to perfection. So 
Uh, I thought that was uh, that was a, a big, big win for the Winnipeg Jets and just the way that it happened. And then, yeah, you mentioned the, the 3-1 loss to Chicago. The Jets, I thought, had a really good first period. Usually that first period is tough coming off of a, a road trip, but they seem to, to shake that pretty quickly. Uh, but ultimately, Marc-Andre Fleury just was able to see probably more pucks than what the Jets would have liked. They started to get to the front of the net again in the third period to create a little bit of havoc. But by then, um, you know, they, they were able to tie the game at one. But Alex Dabrinka, as he's done to a lot of goaltenders, uh, zipped that wrist shot past Connor Hellebuck uh, to give the Blackhawks the lead. And ultimately, the Jets don't get a point out of that one. So now you mentioned going to from 50 percent to 100 percent capacity. I can't imagine a better game for that to happen than the rematch against the Minnesota Wild from last week back at Canada Life Center. Full crowd. It's going to be awesome. So the Jets will no doubt feed off that to start the next week. Yeah, uh, get your tickets at winnipegjets.com slash tickets. And it was funny because we were waiting to do media yesterday uh, and Mitch had texted me a uh, a tweet that uh, Michael Russo from The uh, Athletic down in Minneapolis uh, had put out. It was a quote from uh, Jordan Greenway, who obviously played a big factor in that uh, game last week against the Minnesota Wild. He said, it's going to be fun. We owe them. They better be ready. So, uh, yeah, get your tickets. You definitely want to be down here in downtown Winnipeg. Paul, uh, let's talk about Dave Lowry and, and just this thought process that you need to be physical to win hockey games if you're going to wear a Winnipeg Jets sweater in the National Hockey League right now. Um, you know, we talk, Mitch kind of mentioned it there in the third period. They got back on the body and things started to happen for them a little bit. But it's definitely become a theme here over the last week or so that the team is definitely more physically engaged and things start to go their way. So just why does that have to be a calling card for this group in order to have success? Well, a couple of reasons. I think, number one, that's the way the coach wants you to play. So, and that's the way that Dave played almost 1,100 games in the National Hockey League. So there's always been that talk about a team mirroring the way a coach used to play or wants them to play. There is still an element of physicality that belongs in the National Hockey League and in all levels of hockey. Let's remember the foundation of body contact is a defensive maneuver to eliminate somebody from the puck. And that's how you can then transition, use your speed and skill once you have the puck. So I think it goes back to sort of that grassroots of, okay, let's take the body, let's get on them, let's soften them up, let's cause some turnovers, let's get them to panic with the puck, let's get them to be looking over their shoulder, making maybe a play that they don't want to make or making it too soon. So that's the way that Paul Maurice wanted this team to play. They're built for that. Now Dave Lowry has kind of carried that over and really emphasized that. The Jets have the ability to play that way, and when they do, it is successful for them. Dave said after the game against Chicago, it's a staple of our game. That's the way we need to play, quote-unquote. And he's absolutely right. When they are physically engaged, they are a better team. So sometimes when you get into a game like Chicago where they just don't have that element, it's hard to kind of create it. They did in the third period, didn't go their way in their latest loss to the Chicago Blackhawks to start this homestand. But Winnipeg has a lot of team tough guys, and I'm not talking about fighting, but guys that can defend themselves, big bodies that can get on the puck, that can create that space for those skilled guys like Kyle Connor and certainly for Cole Perfetti, the up and coming guys. But also Dave wants them to play those those skilled guys. They have to be able to go and get the puck off the wall and out of the corner as well. And I remember him saying, however you do that, whether it's getting on somebody's hands, however you go into the corner, you need to come out with the puck because you need to get possession of the puck in order to score goals. Hockey is 99.9% possession. If you don't have the puck, you don't score goals. And if you don't have the puck, you are defending. So that's why there's a correlation between how he wants them to play physically and how they need to play physically in order to have success. It all goes together. They're built this way. I'm not surprised that he's asked them to play this way. It's nothing new to them. There's no strange element to this sort of style of play for the Winnipeg Jets from Dave Lowry handing off from from Paul Maurice. And it just seems that when you get into this conference and certainly within their own division, especially the central, it's the way you have to play in order to be successful. And we've seen that over the last 
handful of games in their own division against teams, well, not necessarily like Chicago, but against St. Louis, Nashville, Dallas, you know, the list goes on, Minnesota again coming up. So I think the other part of this is too, let's call it what it is. The fans enjoy that kind of style of hockey, especially in this market. It's a Canadian market. It's always been an element of the game. So when it's played right and when it's physical and when it's aggressive and there's skill added on and you don't have what we had 15, 20 years ago and multiple fights going on, but you have a fight every once in a while because it's passionate. I think fans really appreciate that. And that's when you become engaged as a fan and the players are certainly engaged when they play that way. And Dave sees that in his team. And that's why there's been such a focus for him to talk about it and get his team to play that way. And the results show that when they do, they have more success in winning games than losing. Mitchell Mark Shifley has caught fire as of late. He's got seven points in his last four games, including goals in four straight. Uh, you know, he sits second on the team in points with 36. Just what have you seen from the Jets' number one center uh, on the other side of the All-Star break that here that has allowed him to have some success and, and start to find that groove and that confidence that has, you know, shown the player that he truly is? The interesting part is, like, some of it is just... I think some of it is just luck, honestly, because oh, sure. you look at the goal, you look at the goal that he scored against the Minnesota wild first game, uh, like out of the all-star break, he kind of doesn't get all of a one timer and it just kind of floats over Kakan and shoulder and goes in. That's the break that he was not getting in the first half of the season. He would get prime scoring opportunities. He'd get the one timer off and he'd get absolutely all of it. And the opposing goaltenders toe would get across and knock it into the corner. That's the luck he was having. So then I think I think there's been a little bit of a shift of luck, a little bit for Mark Shifley. So that's good. But I think part of it is also it's just the numbers balancing out because I was looking at this the other day and I've kind of been keeping an eye on it throughout the season. Uh, in terms of the Winnipeg Jets as a whole, their their shooting percentage this year is down. Uh, it just is in comparison to a number of years. They're a little bit lower in the league rankings than. You know, they were middle of the pack, kind of top 10 over the years of like 2017 through about uh, the start of the 2019-20 season. But then, you know, this year it's kind of fallen off a little bit. And that just, you know, when your shooting percentage is down, clearly you're not scoring as many. So you look at Mark Shifley as a case of that. Um, at the start of February, his shooting percentage was around 11%, which, you know, doesn't sound too bad because, you know, Kyle Connor led the team at that point at 13.2%. But so if you're a, a guy like Mark Shifley coming in with a, an 11% shooting percentage, here's, here's where, what he was at the last uh, five years, 20, 18, 19, 17, and then last year was 16. So that's a drop of 5% from his worst year in the last five years. So that's kind of where, you know, you know, you start to wonder, man, where are the, where are the goals? Where are the, like, that's where it is. Just ultimately they're, they're just not going for him in that point at that point. Um, now he's sitting at 14% thanks to that, uh, that little bit of a run he's been on uh, after the all-star break. So he's creeping up kind of closer to the numbers that he's used to seeing. Uh, so that, that to me is just shows that cause he never, you know, stopped putting pucks to the net or anything it just shows that the numbers are kind of starting to get back to that average level that, that he's enjoyed uh, the last five seasons. So I think that's part of it. Also, you know, as a, as a player himself, I think he's starting to get to the net a little bit more than what maybe he was. Uh, he was trying to beat goaltenders with his shot, which he's got a great shot. That's not taking anything away from that, but I think he's just, He's getting a little bit closer to the net and and picking his spots to do so. The goal against Chicago, while it was mildly fluky with it popping up in the air off of, I believe it was Connor Murphy. It popped up in the air. Flurry missed it. But that's Mark Shifley right on the doorstep to knock it in. So you have to be able to put yourself in those positions to make those plays. And and I think Mark is starting to uh, to do that a little bit more regularly. And it all falls into exactly what Dave Lowry and, and the, the coaching staff is looking for, right? They want to control the front of the net at both ends of the ice and they'll start to get success off of that. And obviously part of it too, is, you know, power play starting to roll. Mark Shifley's got a, a goal at four on four, the, the jets power play is starting to look good. I think, I just think a lot of things are starting to really come together. Uh, not the least of it is just pucks are just starting to go for them at a rate that we're used to seeing from number 55. 
Paul, Mitch just mentioned it there, the power play. Uh, they scored three goals in Nashville on Saturday and in different ways as well. Just what have you seen from the power play? They've started to get that puck moving with pace and misdirection, uh, sort of what was being preached about a third of the way through the season. And now it just seems to have settled into a place where they are really comfortable in that situation. What have you seen on the man advantage that has sort of allowed this team to have a bit of confidence in that area? Well, different components, and I think the number one thing, and I'll kind of break this down a little bit more comprehensive, but number one, for a long time, and I think we can all be in agreement on this, the Jets were fixated on that seam pass, going from one side of the ice to the other for the one-timer, and teams just, they sniffed it out a long time ago, they took it away, and it just didn't work, and the Jets were forcing it through there, and there was a body of sticks and legs. And there was just, there was no way you were getting it through. And if you did, sometimes it wasn't a clean shot. It was going off the heel of a stick because you had to adjust for where the pass was going. And you just couldn't have it like a good one timer. You want right in your feet, right? So you can slap the puck. Anybody that one times puck tells you, Hey, put it right in my feet when I'm stationary, because that's where I want it. That's where I'm going to drive it. And Winnipeg just wasn't able to do that. I mean, it worked well for a long time with Patrick Laine until there was intestinal fortitude from teams that were putting guys out to block shots on them and then clogging up the middle to take away that seam pass. So what the Jets have adjusted, and it's opened up the seam pass again, and I think it's come from a couple of different areas. One, you've got Blake Wheeler on that first power play unit operating down in that bumper spot where he is so adept at making precision passes. That's part of his great skill set. The other part is Pierre-Luc Dubois, net front, big body, you know, a mountain of a man, hard to move, takes the goaltender's eyes away. So that helps as well. You've got two guys on the flanks now that really don't mind shooting the puck. Mark Shifley from the near side to us, and then Kyle Connor to the far side to us where we sit. And both guys are not afraid to whip shots toward the net. And then when you've got Dubois there, and then you've got Wheeler coming around kind of from the bumper back out in front to crash the net, that really helps. But the number one thing for me on the power play, and the reason that that it's gotten successful, is that you have some guys that aren't afraid to shoot up top anymore. Neil Pionk, Nate Schmidt, even Billy Hanela has added to that as well in a short period of time on his recall. Josh Morrissey. So it really starts for me when you look back at the success of the power play for many, many years for the Winnipeg Jets. Where did it start from? Dustin Bufflin. He was not only a precision passer like Blake Wheeler from up top on the power play, but he could bomb it from up there as well. So you didn't know what he was going to do. It was unpredictable. And I think they grabbed that element now and they've employed that, especially with Nate Schmidt, especially with with Josh Morrissey, guys that aren't afraid to shoot the puck. And we've seen that with Billy as well of late. So that opens up other options. If you've got defensemen that are going to try to get it through those seams from the point in toward the front of the net in the slot and then try to fight for loose pucks, that's great. If they want to clog that up and if they want to rush out to you, you've got the flanks for the one-timers with Connor and with Shifley. And by the way, they're doing all of this without Nikolai Ehlers, who's really helpful on that second power play unit. So there's a number of layers to this as to why it's improved and why it's become formidable and why it's become sort of prolific in terms of scoring more goals than recently i guess at the start of the year or even going back to last year they've gotten away from the scene pass they've tried to deliver pucks to the net in other areas from other areas and it's opened up a whole lot of opportunities for them and as a result they've got the skill level on the power play to be able to play whichever way the opposition is giving them whether that's down low and we've even seen blake wheeler come out and pop out with a few wraparound attempts that's another something that has to be honored from the standpoint that when you're doing your video work and preparing on the penalty kill for the Jets, that you have to be cognizant about, think about how are they going to do this? Well, there's all kinds of different fashions that Winnipeg can attack on the power play. And I think when you have more of those than just that one scene pass, then of course it opens up other options for you and you become more successful on it. 
Speaking of successful, uh, Dennis Bayak joins us now on Ground Control, the official podcast of the Winnipeg Jets, and uh, it should be a great little interview. Uh, I hope you enjoy it, and there's a little quiz for uh, Mr. Manitoba at the end. I know he, he, he's, he knows everything about this province, so uh, I'll put him to the test. Hope you enjoy the interview. Shop where the players shop. Jets Gear and TrueNorthShop.com are your authentic team stores. Make sure to stock up on all your favorite Winnipeg Jets and Manitoba Moose merchandise today. Visit one of the five Jets gear locations or shop online at truenorthshop.com. Hi, this is Cole Perfetti and you're listening to Ground Control, the official podcast of the Winnipeg Jets. Joined here on Ground Control, the official podcast of the Winnipeg Jets by TSN play-by-play voice Dennis Bayak. Dennis, thanks so much for taking the time on a snowy Tuesday here in Winnipeg. Really appreciate it. Tyler, you're very welcome. You can probably uh, pick any day of the week for the last number of weeks and say snowy and, and cold. Add cold to that, too. So Seriously, uh, do you have much shoveling to do at your place of residence, or is that taken care of? You know what? When, uh, when we left Toronto uh, 11 years ago, uh, I sold, we sold our snow shovels. And we said we're done with that. <laughs> so uh, we uh, have condo life here in Winnipeg. And uh, so that part of it's taken care of. So that's good. Perfect. And uh, this kind of dovetails into my next topic. Uh, you are from Winnipeg, Osis, Manitoba. Uh, what exactly took you and your family, I guess your family, to, to Winnipeg, Osis? What was the draw up to Winnipeg, Osis? Well, uh, we were there initially. That's where my dad and mom farmed. Okay. And then we actually left for a few years. Uh, I think I would have been around maybe a year and a half or two years old. Uh, we left for Toronto. Farming was difficult. And uh, we had a cousin who was in the construction business. And construction uh, was booming. Uh, so we went to Toronto for a few years. And uh, my dad was involved in, in some construction there. And then from there we went to Prince Albert. Uh, same thing for some construction that was uh, underway there. And then I did get back to Winnipegosis in time to start school. Uh, so it was a uh, busy three years there. I, I vaguely remember uh, the days in Toronto uh, because of uh, just a kid. Yeah. And then I do remember a little bit more of Prince Albert, obviously, and then uh, coming back to the farm and, and uh, stayed at the farm until until I left to uh, go out on my own, but uh, you know that's where we farmed. I went to a uh, elementary school that uh, was in rural Manitoba, a place called Rice Lake, and there was eight grades, one teacher. Oh, wow! And then uh, from there was on to high school in Winnipeg. That elementary school is no longer there, as you would as you would suspect. Yeah. Uh, the building might still be standing, but the school is no longer in in operation. But uh, then it was off to high school and. Uh, from there, I came into Winnipeg for a while and uh, worked at a company called Beaver Oil on uh, Logan and McPhillips or in that area. Yeah. Uh, took some radio courses uh, at CNIB. Uh, we went into class once a week and then got a job in Flin Flon. And from there on, you'll have to wait till the book comes out to find out exactly what happened after that. <laughs> okay, perfect. <laughs> <laughs> that was quite the prologue, though. Oh, there you go. I got to build it up. You yep. know, you got to make it so when that book comes out, there's a there's a lineup. Yeah. Uh, yep. All right. Uh, obviously, where we are now, we know how this book is going at the moment. You're the play by play voice of the uh, Winnipeg Jets on TSN. Uh, one of the big differences this year, though, is uh, for the last number of months, you and your broadcast partner Kevin Sawyer have been broadcasting the games remotely, uh, much like you did all of last year as well. Um, off a monitor. So just what's the, what's that been like? And what's the big, obviously there's a difference of you're not there, but what's the big part about that? That is the drawback, I suppose, for you guys. Yeah, this would be a chapter in the book that I'd ever thought that I would have to write. Uh, and it does go back to last year when, uh, with the COVID restrictions, uh, we didn't travel. We called all games off monitor. Uh, maybe the biggest thing, uh, that, that fans maybe don't, understand or don't know uh, is a lot of the pictures that we show we have no control over because you're basically relying on the home team feed uh, for their their output 
And whatever they are showing, now we do have some control. Uh, we usually have one or two cameras in the building. So uh, if they are going to a promo for upcoming games for them, uh, we can say we have footage of the Winnipeg Jets bench. So we're going to show that. And then Kevin and I will talk about the Winnipeg Jets bench or just some generalities about the Winnipeg Jets. So that's the one big thing is you don't control everything that you put on the air. A lot of that is controlled by, by the home feed. Uh, from our, from my standpoint, from a play by play, so much of it is based on jerseys. Uh, and we've seen, this over the last uh, few years, uh, maybe Tampa Bay might have been the first where they came in with the the third jersey with the different numbers on it uh, that became a little bit harder to pick up. Uh, the Ottawa uh, third jersey last year was, uh, to be blunt from a broadcast standpoint, was absolutely ridiculous. Yeah, uh, There would be times where you would freeze the frame and you'd see five Ottawa Senators on the ice and you couldn't pick up one number. Oh, geez. Um, and teams have followed suit. The Dallas ones the other night, the green on green, oh. uh, those had some challenges. Uh, Edmonton's dark one with the orange numbers, uh, that one has some challenges. So that's, from a play-by-play standpoint, that has probably been uh, the biggest challenge, is, is we're so, we've been programmed to be so cognizant of recognition and, and proper identification that uh, it's bothersome. It really is. There's there's nights where you come home from a game and and you're upset because you know that you messed up some numbers and some names. Right. And that's just the way it is. After that, it's sometimes you don't get to see the uh, the time what's left in the penalty. Uh, you don't get to see the clock. You don't get to see what's happening behind the play. We saw this in the last. Uh, road trip with the Winnipeg Jets. Uh, you know that there's a scrap going on behind the play, but until the home feed gets a camera over there, uh, you really can't start talking about it because you really don't know who's involved and what's all happening. So those are some of the little challenges. Uh, I mean, I, but you know, I will preface that with I certainly understand, uh, the reason why we stopped traveling in the middle of December. Yeah. Uh, you know, Kevin Sawyer and I are fortunate we're on the charter. Uh, so we are protected a little bit, but the rest of our crew, and we travel a crew of about seven or eight, uh, they're not protected. They travel commercial and, and, uh, and, and all the other testing that, that needs to be done that goes along with it. So, uh, it was more from their standpoint that, uh, that we stopped traveling, but, uh, understand why we did and looking forward to, uh, resuming our traveling here, I think with the, with the next trip that starts Monday in Calgary. Oh, exciting. Uh, glad to have you back on the charter. Yes, uh, it'll be uh, good to be back on. Yeah. Cool. All right. That's uh, You heard it here first, folks, on Ground Control. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Dennis, let's talk about some uh, Winnipeg jets focus stuff. Uh, Kyle Connor, I mean, he's been the talk of the town this year. He was at the All-Star game for the first time in his career. He's got 50 points on the year, 24 goals or sorry, 26 goals, rather, 24 assists. Uh, a very balanced season for him. Just what have you seen from the the young Michigan forward that has uh, seen the success come his way? Well, and then the other thing to add to that that's very impressive is uh, his road point total. Uh, it, it, it's uh, He's been a very good road player. Lots of times you'll see a player that has great numbers at home and not great numbers on the road. That doesn't matter to Kyle Connor. Uh, he's been a production machine no matter where he plays. So, you know what, I, I love telling the story, and I've told it before, uh, of when he got he, he was up with the Jets, then he got sent back at the start of the, of the following year. And he was not happy with getting sent back. Matthew Perot gets hurt early in the year. Kyle Connor gets a recall. And I I've, I've re- remember this like it was yesterday. When you watched him play, you just knew – that Kyle Connor was done with the American Hockey League, yeah, uh, and he and and he's never gone back since. And so you watch that now when other players uh, get get called up. Uh, are they ready for it? Can they can they do it for four or five games in a row? And Kyle Connor did, and as a result, uh, you know he's with the Winnipeg Jets ever since, and does everything at a high rate of speed uh, from his thinking to his hands to his feet, to his shot, uh, and, and everything that, that goes along with being 
uh, a very good National Hockey League player. So, and I think the other thing that, and you've seen this, uh, we've seen him mature a little bit. Yeah. Uh, we've seen him become uh, a better, far better speaker when it comes to the interviews and all of that. And yeah. that's all maturity. So, so good on him. And uh, having another great year, good for him to go to the All Star Game, and uh, and represent the Winnipeg Jets and represent himself very well. And uh, you know, you watch him kill penalties now, and just some of the little plays. I mean, the game last night, the the chance that he had, it was on a stick and off a stick in a heartbeat. Yeah, uh, great save by by Mark Andre Fleury. But uh, to watch Kyle Connor play is uh, is something special. Another player that obviously would like to see their development path go the same way as Kyle Connor is Cole Perfetti. And uh, he's found a home here on the Winnipeg Jets uh, this season, uh, primarily playing alongside Pierre-Luc Dubois as of late. He's got 16 NHL games under his belt, five points. Hasn't found the score sheet as of late, but just what have you seen from the the young 20-year-old this season that has allowed him to stick up with the big club? Yeah, we can't let the score sheet uh, fool us here on on Cole Perfetti, and we we do look at that. I mean, yep. uh, you look at it and you say, "Wow, he's playing with with Pierre Luc Dubois and Kyle Connor a lot." His point totals maybe should be higher than what they are, and uh, and they will be. And some of that is uh, because he hasn't quite made the play quick enough, but some of that is he has made the play and it just hasn't been finished off. Uh, so that's you know you take those two things into into account here when you look at that but he's been very impressive his creativity is something that the Winnipeg Jets knew they had from the time they drafted him and we're seeing that and he's talked about this over the last 10 days how with every game that goes by he feels a little more comfortable and I think we're seeing that so uh, the next question mark with regards to Cole Perfetti is uh, if everybody stays healthy and Nikolai Ehlers gets back in the lineup what does that do to the top six? And what does that do to Cole Perfetti? And, and give Dave Lowry credit. Uh, Cole Perfetti is going to be a top six forward in the National Hockey League. So that's the situation that he has put him in, and that's where he has played. He's seen some power play time uh, and all that little by little, uh, but that will be the next test as to where is his game at uh, when Nikolai Ehlers is set to return and then what happens with the top six, and what does uh, what does Dave Lowry uh, you know elect to do at that point in time? But but Cole Perfetti has been uh, everything that uh, they expected from him. Yes, you'd like to see the point total up a little bit more, but he's not the only one scoring for for whatever reason has been a bit of a challenge at times for this team, and uh, and that. But uh, the creativity that uh, that they knew was there uh, is there. We've seen it. Yeah, you hit the nail on the head there. While the points aren't necessarily coming, he's doing good things with the puck, and he's never out of position. So uh, look for things to spark up for Cole Perfetti in the future. Uh, Dennis, it's been much talked about uh, the team's defense coming into that 1920 season. Obviously, they they lose Dustin Bufflin, Ben Sherratt, Tyler Myers, the the big three, and and the Winnipeg and Jacob Truba for that matter as well. Yep, you know. The, the Jets' defense has been something that has been talked about as not the strongest of points for this club, but they've slowly built through the draft, and for better or for worse, you're sort of seeing that depth come to life here over this season. Uh, you know, names like Declan Chisholm, Billy Hainala, Dylan Sandberg, Johnny Kovacevic. Uh, I'm probably missing somebody in there as well. Just what have you thought of the way the Jets have sort of stocked the cupboards here and, and allowed them to have that next man up mentality on the back end? Well, it's going to make decisions going forward difficult for Kevin Shoveldayoff and his staff, and that's good. Uh, that's exactly how you want it. Uh, you want decisions to be difficult because – uh, you named a bunch of youngsters that uh, some of them, uh, they're going to have to find a spot for them to play. Uh, you know, Billy Hanela, uh, Logan Stanley got back in the lineup last night with Neil Pionk being out. So now, again, everybody stays healthy. Neil Pionk gets back in the lineup uh, against Minnesota. And what does that do uh, to your sixth defenseman? Who stays in? Who comes out? Again, a tough decision for Dave Lowry, uh, but a decision that, that is good to have to make because those it means you have some depth in the organization and now you're going to you talk about the future dylan sandberg has shown that he's ready to play 
Uh, Johnny Kovacevic has shown that he's not very far off. Declan Chisholm has shown that he's not far off. And Billy, Billy Handel, I think, with every game that goes by, has a little bit more confidence into his, into his game, into his structure. And he is showing that he probably deserves to play on a regular basis in the National Hockey League. So, uh, tough decisions. Uh, but I think that's, uh, that has been an area of concern. There's no doubt that, that ever since the four that you mentioned that, uh, that departed, uh, there has been a vacancy back there. And, uh, you know, the Jacob Truba situation was different. And the Winnipeg Jets, a terrific deal there where they not only got uh, Neil Pionk back, who yeah. uh, maybe was a better player than a lot of people thought he was going to be, uh, they got Billy Hanel in, in, in kind of in that same you know era. So uh, uh, an area where there was a weakness is now an area of strength and, uh, and certainly some decisions going forward, whether it be at this year's trade light, deadline day or whether it be in the offseason. Uh, they're going to have to find some room uh, for some of these young defensemen. Dennis, December 17th, 2021 was definitely a strange day here for the Winnipeg Jets, and, and you've been along for the ride since they returned to the city here in, in Winnipeg. Um, Paul Maurice, obviously, departing the organization, and Dave Lowry taking over as head coach. And the question I have for you is more about just what kind of stamp Dave Lowry has put on this organization, but I'll give you the platform as well. Just what did Paul Maurice mean to you as a, as a broadcaster and, and as a fellow hockey person just – him leaving the organization was obviously tough for everybody involved, but and also just what has Dave done uh, since taking over? Well, on Paul Maurice, and, and keep in mind, we go back to the Toronto days. We were there together for uh, for his tenure with the Toronto Maple Leafs too. So uh, I knew uh, Paul Maurice maybe better than some other people when he came to Winnipeg and, and joined the Winnipeg Jets. Uh, to me, in ways, uh, the face of the franchise because. He was such a good speaker and spoke so eloquently on not only Winnipeg Jets topics, uh, but everyday topics and, and sometimes not just about hockey. Uh, you know, and, and I, I think we all miss those, those conversations with Paul Maurice. Uh, we were fortunate, uh, as part of our broadcast group that we got meetings with him on game days and you learned a lot about the game from Paul Maurice. And he makes a difficult decision uh, to step aside, and Dave Lowry comes in, and uh, and we've had some of the same benefits. We have those same broadcast meetings with Dave Lowry, and and he's been very good to give us some insight as to exactly what he's looking for from his players. Uh, I remember one of the first meetings, Kevin Sawyer said to him, "How would you describe yourself as a coach?" He said, "Direct," and and I think we've seen that, and and. Uh, but some of the same things that Paul Maurice talked about, we hear Dave Lowry talk about. Take the puck to the net, traffic in front of, of the opposition goal. So so some of that has stayed the same. I, I think we've maybe seen a more uh, aggressive uh, Winnipeg Jets team, and I don't know if that's because of Dave Lowry or if it's because of the situation that the Winnipeg Jets find themselves in uh, in, a, in a battle here for a playoff spot. But if you look at the, at the number of majors uh, over the last uh, three, four weeks here, you know, that number has climbed a little bit. Uh, and again, I think some of that is because of where they are in the standings and how crucial every two points is. But, uh, you know, it's not easy, I think, coming in midseason in this situation. Uh, I mean, we don't see that very often where uh, a coach comes in after one coach resigns. Usually there's a coach been fired, somebody else comes in. Sometimes it is an assistant coach, and, and it's, you know, I think he may be even easier in that standpoint. But uh, I think Dave, Dave Lowry has uh, risen to the challenge here. Uh, I think with every game that goes by, we see a little bit more of Dave Lowry's style from where the way he played the game. Yeah. Uh, over a thousand NHL games for him, and, and he earned every minute of that. Uh, I think we're starting to see some of that. So, um, you know, I think Dave Lowry's done an excellent job. Uh, I think the players are responding to to what he wants to see, and they've got a challenge in front of them here. Dennis, part of being a broadcaster is the fact that you need to know little fun facts about pretty much every player that's going to skate in the game on any given night. And you're from Manitoba. I would consider you Mr. Manitoba on a lot of things, uh, on a lot of fronts. Maybe some others, maybe not so much. But I'm going to give you a bit of a quiz here. I'm going to name five NHL players one by one, and then 
For each one, I'm going to tell you how many games they've played in the National Hockey League, and then you're going to tell me their hometown in Manitoba. Ooh. Okay. And, and this is going to span, I think I've got about a 30-year range here uh, to go from. So this should cover off your time uh, in hockey. All right. So the first player is Marty Murray. He played 261 NHL games. Where does Marty Murray come from? Well, I know he played uh, for Brandon. Um, see, I'm not that great on those hometowns uh, going back then. I think it's become more of an issue uh, lately. Here. See, I didn't call a whole lot of Marty Murray's games. Okay. You know, I probably did in the Western Hockey League a little bit. So uh, I, I'm going to have to pass on that one. You can tell me where he's from. All right, so Hockey Reference has him listed as Deloraine, Manitoba. Okay. And uh, I believe it's a, a smaller uh, hamlet or village, uh, Lyleton, Manitoba, is I think his hometown. Uh, so any, do you have any connections to either of those places? I do not. I do not uh, have any connections to, to Deloraine or Lyleton. So um, never, uh, never played ball there as a youngster. We did some traveling around Manitoba playing ball and those sorts of things, but yep. never, got to those, never got to that area. All right, the next uh, player up is Ken Reggett, goaltender, 575 NHL games played. Where is he from? Boy, you're going to make me sound like an idiot here. No, uh, really? I can, tell you, I can tell you Ken Reggett's stories. Uh, when I was with the Saskatoon Blades and he was with the Lethbridge Hurricanes uh, and the great goaltender that he was. <laughs> yeah. uh, but again, I, I have, I'm not sure where Ken Reggett's from. Brandon. Brandon Manitoba. There you go. Okay, I think you'll get the yeah, next I, one. I try to stay away from some of the main centers because you always worry. Yeah. Back to what you said before, some players will be listed in one as a birthplace there because that's where the hospital was. Right, uh, yes. But that is not exactly uh, where they grew up. But anyway, let's carry on, see yeah. if I can nail one here eventually. Okay, uh, this one you should get because I've literally heard you say it on the broadcast, which is why I'm. I'm this is a bunt here. Uh, Cody McLeod, 776 NHL games. Uh, see on the spot, um, and I know where he's from. I just can't. It, I can't come with, come little, up with it off the top of my head. Town just down the road on 16 from Russell. Starts with Box Warren. Uh, other way, going back towards. Uh, Canada. what's the other way from from there? South. Uh, you're gonna have to help me out here. Binscarth. Binscarth. Yes, exactly. Okay. Uh, any connections to Binscarth? You ever been there? Nope. No? No. Nope. Stop for gas? Russell. Russell. We had a teacher in uh, elementary school who was from Russell. Okay. Uh, and then the last one I'll give you is uh, Travis Sandheim. This one, he's a current player uh, from Manitoba. Elkhorn, Manitoba. There see, you go. I can get that one. Yeah. That, see, this makes sense. I mean, you would call his game, well, you would have called his game very recently. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And, and, and uh, if I would have, if, I would have had time over a beverage or two. I would have come up with Vince Garth, um, and uh, and there is some others, but uh, uh, but yeah, I mean, it's I, I know where they played, uh, but sometimes trying to come up with exactly where they're from isn't that easy, as we just found out. Yes. <laughs> All right. <laughs> uh, it's a day off for the Winnipeg Jets. It's a day off for you, as far as I'm concerned. So I've taken up enough of your time. Enjoy the day, and thanks so much for uh, joining me here on Ground Control. Got it. You're very welcome. Have a good day. Winnipeg Jets fans, did you know that online 50-50 tickets presented by PlayNow.com are available for all Winnipeg Jets games? That's right. Whether the Jets play on the road or at home, you can participate in the game day 50-50 draw. The winner will take home half of the jackpot with all proceeds in support of the True North Youth Foundation. Remember to buy your tickets on all Jets game days at WinnipegJets.com slash 50 50 all right guys i put dennis to the test now it's time for you to take my little quiz uh as you're both from manitoba so i'm gonna name two what i would consider relatively obscure nhl players in the grand scheme but you know they're from manitoba so they have a place here in our hockey history and so i want you to tell me where they are from what is their hometown as i asked dennis um so i'm so brutal at this just a heads up but okay Okay, well, I'm going to give you a layup. I think it's a layup for you, Mitchell. Uh, Colby Roback. Oh, Ooh. I reffed him. Yes. Ooh. Well, he's, so I'm not sure what's listed, 
I think, oh, okay, he's either Gilbert Plains or he's Grand View, I believe. So I'm going to go Gilbert Plains, but I have probably an entire section of the parkland furious at me right now. <laughs> well, so I'll, I'll say I'll, I'll say you're right, because according to I'm on hockeyreference.com uh-huh. and they have it listed as Dauphin. Yeah, see, I don't think it's Dauphin because he played his minor hockey on a team called I think it was called Grand Plains, which was kind of like the combination of Grand View and Gilbert Plains and that would be the only time that I really would have played against him or refed him. So that I believe he's from one of those two areas. I just can't remember off the top of my head. Yeah. So, so to qualify this, I mean, when you grew up in the parkland area, the hospital's in Dauphin. So if you're going to have a baby and you're from Grandview, you're going into Dauphin to have your baby, right, Mitchell? I believe so. Like right, that right. being said, I've never been in that position in, in the old parkland area but <laughs> I, I think i think that is the case yeah yeah so well, that's where you would get sorry that's where you would get a little bit of confusion oh well birthplace dolphin well he must be from dolphin well no mm. he's from outside right and winnipeg yes. osis or whatever because the hospital's in dolphin so you've got to go into dolphin for the hospital so it's not there exactly where his hometown is so now it makes you've explained sense. it well yes <laughs> all right so to clarify he's from gilbert plains uh and he was born in Dauphin, so I think Paul's theory stands about the whole birthing uh, situation. Uh, and for those interested, that's how it starts. Yes, and for those interested, uh, Colby Roback has been playing in the Dell uh, with the. I'm probably going to say this wrong. The Shawinigan Wild Wings uh, for three years now. Uh, he's got 11 points in 41 games this year, and he has 47 NHL games played, uh, most of them with the Florida Panthers and uh, a quick five gamer with the Anaheim Ducks. Okay, Paul, over to you. Uh-oh. And we're going to scroll, and we're scrolling, and we're adjusting the parameters so I can get what I need to you properly. Okay. What about hints? If I don't get it first off, can I get a hint? <laughs> yeah, you're going to get a hint, maybe. Well, uh, let me see if I can get it. Okay, so I'll I'll back things up for your generation. And okay. That's not, a, that is not a slight. Okay. Uh, okay. Reed Simpson. Ooh. Ooh. That is Ooh. tough. Yeah. You know what? Do you uh, know the name? I do. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And oh boy, ah, uh, he's not a Winnipeg guy. No. He's from outside the city. Uh, he's north I of the city, say, north of the city. Yeah. I was going to say inner lake. Yeah. I was going to say sort of uh, north of the city inner lake. I want to say, is he a Selkirk guy? No, that would be too easy. He's, he's from Flin Flon. Ah, okay. So he's not inner lake either. No. Yes. So when I say north okay. of the city, that was a very like broad clue. I was yeah. Say. <laughs> north of the city. <laughs> north of the- just a hop skip and a jump. Yeah, yeah, he's just south of Thompson, Paul. <laughs> uh, uh, can I try again? Can I get one more? Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, okay. okay. What do you got? Okay. I like this game. It's fun. Yeah. Because I, listen, I know Mitchell does as well because, you know, we are from, as you are, Tyler, from Manitoba, and we pride ourselves on knowing the guys that have come up, and there's always sort of a connection there. Somebody knows somebody that knows that guy or that person or that athlete, right? So this is important to me, but Reed Simpson, eh, eh, as Jamie Thomas would say, eh, you know, (laughs) that's obscure. Uh... Okay, this one, you should get this one, I think. Um, okay. Pat Falloon. Oh, he's from Fox Warren. Yes. Fox yeah. Warren. Okay, Driven through Fox it. Warren there many times, yeah. or past it, I guess, on the number yeah. 16. His, yeah. uh, I think it was his nephew, actually, played for the Yorkton Terriers during my time in Yorkton, Saskatchewan. was part of the, the RBC National Champion uh, Terrier team. So. Oh, there you go. Yeah, there you go. He was a good little player. Uh, okay, let's get back to talking about the Winnipeg Jets. Uh, Mitch, the week ahead, uh, like we mentioned kind of off the top, the Jets are welcoming back 15,000 
screaming Jets fans, masked of course, uh, to Canada Life Center uh, for a four-game homestand. We're already one game into it. The Jets taking on the Minnesota Wild on Wednesday, following that up with a Thursday tilt against the Seattle Kraken, and then closing things off against the Edmonton Oilers, which uh, should be a great hockey game Saturday afternoon. Who doesn't love an afternoon game? I know I do. Uh, Mitch, just your thoughts on the week ahead. Yes, all the 3 p.m. starts. Um, I I look ahead and I think it's hard for me to even look past the the, the Minnesota game because I just think it's going to be – I'm hoping it's not one of those ones that gets really built up and then it's just kind of – a game that occurs, but um, I just think with the the two teams, as much uh, animosity as there is, especially uh, this season, seemingly, um, I just think that's going to be a spectacular hockey game. And if you're the Jets and you can get and you can get a win out of that one and kind of nip that uh, that one loss to the Chicago Blackhawks right there and it doesn't become too consecutive or anything like that then I think that's a huge momentum build. And we had Trevor Kidd on the postgame show after the game against the Blackhawks, and he said, do not discount the difference between, for the players anyways, between having, you know, 50% and 100% in the stands. It is it is a massive difference, and, and he feels, with all the talk about emotion and everything, he feels the players can pull from that. So that's going to be, uh, that's going to be quite the hockey game. And then, yeah, it'd be cool to see the Seattle Kraken in town. I know uh, a cousin of mine actually was trying to get tickets earlier in the season for the originally scheduled game, uh, which I think was early January, but anyways, um, so it'd be good to actually see the Kraken in town. Uh, Jets fans can get their first look at them. And then uh, the Edmonton Oilers new coach in uh, Jay Woodcroft. Uh, so obviously it'd be interesting to see if there's any difference to how they look, obviously Connor McDavid and Leon Dreisaitl are going to do their thing, but um, it will be interesting. Early reports are, it seems like the, their defensemen are standing up at the blue line a lot more and, and the entries maybe aren't as easy as they were previously, but something to, to keep an eye on, especially because the Oilers are one of those teams that the Jets are battling with to try to get into that uh, wild card spot. Um, so it's a big week, you know, this whole month you're, you're, you're facing Western conference opponents. There's some central teams mixed in there for sure, but you want to make hay on home ice and you've got three, games coming up here that uh, you really want to try to get as many points out of as you possibly can before you head out on the road for what's looking like quite a, a tough road trip with Calgary, Dallas, Colorado, and it closes out in Arizona, but um, you need, you need wins. And that's the, the jets will say that until they're blue in the face uh, for the rest of the season schedule is not going to be easy, but uh, it all starts with the game against the Minnesota wild on Wednesday. Paul, we'll close things out with you here. Uh, Christian Reichel, he's been in the lineup for every game since the All-Star break, and he's been on that sort of third line uh, and played 14 minutes on Monday night against the Chicago Blackhawks with Lowry and Kopp, and, and that line was clicking. And and I'll give credit to Mitchell here, which we so often do. Um, I think he mentioned that Christian Reichel resembles a Brandon Tanev-esque, or at least that's the the look that he's presented the last few games. Just what have you thought of his play uh, since being returned to the lineup uh, and just his chemistry that he's slowly starting to build with uh, Lowry and Cop? You know what, guys? I always like players that come in and have to sort of reinvent themselves as a player and aren't adverse to doing that. Not that they're trying to you know, say, well, I'm an offensive guy. I can't play that way. No, you know, when you get a guy like Christian Reichel who understands that the pinnacle for him is to play in the National Hockey League and how do I get there? But more importantly, how do I stay there? This is a guy that scored 34 goals in Red Deer in the Western Hockey League. He was an offensive player. He has a skill set that looked like he was going to be a pronounced sort of offensive player or quasi-offensive player in pro and and get to the national hockey league well he's got there scoring 12 goals once in in the ahl three years with the manitoba moose he's had some injury issues but he's also 23 years old there's still a lot of time for this player and i've got a lot of time for him because this is a guy that has figured out how he needs to play to stay in the national hockey league and reward himself for what's been a real good opportunity on the third line with, as you mentioned, Andrew Kopp and Adam Lowry. 
first off, he's been hard on the puck and he's not afraid to get in on the body and cause some chaos. And for that, that's where you're going to get puck possession, especially in the opposition zone. And that's where the puck's maybe going to go to the net. And that's where you're going to get an opportunity to either roll off the wall, find a puck, shoot it, use some of that offensive ability that you have, or get a rebound. But the fact of the matter is he needs to be responsible in his own zone and he needs to do the things that complement those other two players. And he's done that. And at the risk of removing a little bit of, of his offensive game. And he talked about that with me this week. I had a wonderful chat with him about sort of reinventing himself and just changing the way he plays until he gets comfortable, builds the trust of the coach, and then can start to add on like we've seen happen in other sort of players' games. Josh Morrissey, Brandon Tannum, as you mentioned, even going back to last year, and, and now he's in Seattle. We'll see him come in later this week, but that's Mason Appleton as well. I mean, these guys have to build a foundation of being responsible first and then getting some ice time and then kind of branching out from there with their offensive game. I think he's been a real great addition to the Winnipeg Jets. Let's not forget that for a while over the last couple of years, there was a, uh, there was a bit of a devoid in the right-handed shot forward depth of the Winnipeg Jets. And this is a guy that looked at himself and said, I'm a right-handed shot. Maybe this is going to be my opportunity. I've got to do the little things right. He has. He's been granted the opportunity. And because he plays right wing and has a right-handed shot, he's been elevated to that third line. And he's kind of running with that opportunity. It's been kind of fun to watch. You cheer for stories like that, certainly. And Christian Reichel has been one of them. The other thing that's been interesting, too, about him is, just like Paul Stastny at 36 years old, still talks to his dad about his game. Christian Reichel talks to his dad, Robert, about his game. Robert, a longtime NHLer, played in Calgary, had some great years offensively, and then in Toronto and a few other stops with the New York Islanders. And Christian's trying to emulate what his dad did in the National Hockey League, and he's got a great sort of pedigree for that. I think he's going to be a very good player for years to come for the Winnipeg Jets, and he's just starting his NHL career, but he's doing it the right way. Way. getting in being responsible doing the foundational things that he needs to do and i think we're going to start to see the the offensive add-on coming into his game in the next 35 or so games for the winnipeg jets well that just about wraps it up for ground control the official podcast of the winnipeg jets it's been a great episode i think anyway uh, on behalf of myself tyler Escabel. Jets TV's Mitchell Clinton and 680 CJOB's Paul Edmonds. Thanks so much for listening. We hope uh, the driveway is shoveled by now. Uh, we've given you lots of lead time uh, to do so. So everybody, have yourself a great rest of the week. You'll hear from us again next week. Go Jets, go. This has been Ground Control, the official podcast of the Winnipeg Jets, hosted by Jets TV. For Jets news, videos, and more, head to winnipegjets.com. Proceed, we're able.